Chapter One of the Boy Scouts in the Maine Woods. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Debbie R. Baker Robinson. The Boy Scouts in the Maine Woods by Herbert Carter. Afloat on the Winding Aroostook. I tell you, Bumpus Hawtree, I can do it as easy as turn my hand over once I get the hang of the thing. Oh, you don't say so, Giraffe. Here you've been trying for these three days past with your silly old bow and stick, twirling away like an organ grinder, and never so much as struck a single spark of fire yet. Well, you see, there are a whole lot of things about the thing I don't know. Sure there are. You can do everything but the right thing. You spin that stick with the point that fits in the hole you made in that block of wood like fun. But your fine tinder don't even smoke, as far as I can see. Huh, you'll see it do more than that, and before the end of this main trip, I'll give you to understand, Bumpus. Oh, will I? How kind of you, Giraffe. You needn't say like that you didn't believe I'd ever beat it out. I've made fires ten different ways, and you know that. And listen to me. I'm just bound to get one going in that South Sea Island method we've read about, or give up trying. You hear me, Bumpus? No trouble about that, Giraffe. Tell you what I'll do, though, in the generosity of my heart. Make a wager with you about that fire business, and it's a treat of ice cream for the crowd for the loser. I'll take you on that, quickly snapped back the long-legged Boy Scout who was curled up in the stern of the canvas canoe that was being pushed along by the energetic arms of a sturdy guide as straight as his name was the opposite, it being Eli Crooks. Then let's have a clear understanding, observed the fat lad, squatting rather awkwardly in the bow of the same craft. Say, you other fellers, do you hear what we're talking about? And he raised his voice a trifle so that the occupants of the two other boats that were close by might listen, just as if they had not been keeping their ears wide open. For when Bumpus and Giraffe got into a hot argument, there was generally plenty of fun in the air. One of the other canoes contained three scouts, as could be told from various parts of their khaki uniforms that they wore, even when off on a hunting trip. The clear-eyed fellow who seemed to be in charge of the party was Tad Brewster. One of his companions was known as Step Hen Bingham, because, as a little chap, he had insisted at school that was the way his name should be spelled, while the third was an exceedingly wiry boy, Davy Jones by name, and who had always been a human monkey when it came to athletics, climbing trees, and doing all sorts of queer stunts. In the third boat was a shorter main guide, a sort of slow chap who came by the name of Jim Hasty, just as the other did that of Crooks, and the scout with him was Alan Hollister, a lad born in the very state they were now exploring, and who assisted the scoutmaster in his duties. All these six boys belonged to the Silver Fox Patrol, connected with a troop of scouts located in a New York town called Cranford. Two more had been unable to take the main trip, which had already carried the bunch through some adventurous times in another part of the state, whither they had first gone in order to overtake a gentleman just then moose hunting, and with whom Tad had to get in touch for certain business reasons. Now they were on the Aroostook River, the three boats, as well as the party, having been transported from Grindstone by rail, and launched at the junction of the Masardis with the first-mentioned stream. One of the guides, having been brought up in this region, had promised the boys rare sport if only they would trust to his judgment in the matter. The trip was of indefinite length, the only stipulation being that they should not go outside the United States when approaching the New Brunswick border along the great St. John's River. All of them seemed to be just bubbling over with enthusiasm and spirits. With a new voyage before them, plenty to eat aboard the canoes, guns with which to secure game, tents provided by Jim Hasty at his home town, and everything lovely while the goose hung high, as Bumpus had put it, really there was no excuse for any of the scouts to feel downcast. In their former trip around the Penobscot region, the boys had had the good fortune to be chiefly instrumental in causing the arrest of a couple of fleeing yeggmen who had broken into several banks, and for whose arrest quite a decent reward was offered. Not only that, but they had recovered valuable bonds and papers that would undoubtedly cause the bank officials to back up the offer they had made, 
which was to the effect that two thousand dollars would be paid to the parties returning the said bonds and no questions asked bumpus had been the one who seemed chiefly concerned over this money matter for it happened that the fat scout wanted dearly to visit the far west and was always talking of california together with the game to be met with in the famous rock mountains and with this windfall coming to their almost exhausted treasure box it now seemed as though the silver fox patrol might get away when the next vacation came around giraffe the boy with the long neck which he could twist around in a way his comrades despaired of ever imitating had one particular weakness he was a regular fire worshipper they depended on giraffe to start the fires whether a cooking blaze or the big campfire around which they loved to sit or lie after supper was over many times did tad have to caution him about his recklessness in this regard and his vigilance increased now that they were in a state where forest preservation was of such moment that a special fire warden with many assistants was employed to see that the laws were strictly enforced and intending hunters were not allowed to go forth without being accompanied by a licensed guide to make sure that all fires were utterly extinguished before breaking camp of course when giraffe took it upon himself to find out if he could not make a fire after every known method there was more or less fun for the crowd but he had proved that his studies in this direction were worth while for he had used flint and steel matches a burning glass for the sun to do the business and various other methods with stunning success but he had thus far been stumped as he himself expressed it when it came to starting a blaze after the formula of the south sea islanders his little bow was made according to directions and would whirl the pointed stick with tremendous force in the basin that had the hole in the bottom but thus far just as bumpus so exultantly declared the aspiring giraffe had failed to accomplish the object he had in view well now remarked giraffe since you've got all the bears and moose in the aristook country to listen suppose you go and explain what we're driving at bumpus when the other boys had declared that they had heard the whole argument the wager is cream for the crowd at the first chance the fat boy went on with pointed emphasis giraffe says he can start a fire with that bunty little bow of his and the twirling stick that heats things up and makes the fine tinder take fire when you've got the hang of things he's got to do it before we wind up this particular trip and at a time when one or more of us are on deck to act as witnesses hear that fellows what he says are the exact conditions added the confident giraffe and just make up your minds i'm going to do that same stunt yet why half a dozen times already i've been pretty close to getting fire but something always seems to happen just at the last minute once my bowstring sawed through another time the plaguey stick burst then bumpus had to fall all over me just when i felt sure the spark was going to come in the tender and the last time you may remember when i sang out that i had it why down came that heavy rain and put me out of business a general laugh followed these complaining remarks from the tall scout looks like you might be hoodooed giraffe said davy jones all right no matter what's the matter if grit and perseverance can accomplish the business you'll see it done in great style sooner or later cried giraffe who could be quite determined when he chose then let's hope it will be sooner remarked step hen because you know him well enough to understand that we'll have no peace of our lives till he either gets his little fire started or else makes a failure of the game anyhow broke in allan from the rear no matter how it comes out the rest of us stand to have a free feast later on it's heads i win tails you lose for the balance of the silver fox patrol and in advance we hand our united thanks to bumpus or will it be giraffe and bumpus went on calmly while giraffe is worrying his poor old head over that puzzle every time we get settled in camp i'll be improving each shining hour like the busy little bee trying out my new gun told you fellows i was going to invest the first chance i got and here's my brand new double barrel that's guaranteed the man said to knock the spots out of any big game that i hold it on huh grunted giraffe who seemed a trifle grumpy on account of having his fire-making abilities made fun of for he was quite touchy on that score chances are it'll knock spots out of you first of all 
or give you a few to remember it by if you go and get excited and pull both triggers at once as you're likely to do if i know you at all bumpus what in the wide world did you go and get a big ten-bore for when you're such a short fellow asked tad who had often wanted to find out about this particular subject bumpus who was fondling his new possession grinned rather sheepishly well he remarked you see tad's marlin and davy's gun are both twelve gauge and i thought we ought to have variety in the crowd so i got a ducking gun besides i knew it would be better when i came to shoot buckshot in it just like i've got in the chambers right now ready for any old moose bull that chooses to show up and in fact fellows it was the only sort of shotgun i could buy unless i took one of them pump guns and i just couldn't think of working all that machinery when i get so rattled you know please keep that blunderbuss pointed the other way bumpus said step hen yes for goodness sake don't you turn it around here called out giraffe if ever you blew a hole in the bottom of this canvas canoe we'd go down like a stone i'd be sorry for that remarked bumpus still fondling his new purchase lovingly although he kept it pointed ahead as directed because you see we've got a lot of good grub aboard this canoe and it might get soaked huh thinking of the grub before you take me into consideration are you grunted giraffe and perhaps he might have said more only just at that instant eli turned his head and made a remark to him which caused the long-necked boy to lift his head and then shout out excitedly a bear a bear over there on the bank ahead oh where did i put my gun almost shrieked step hen who was forever misplacing things and then finding them again in the most unexpected places bumpus knock him over there's the best chance to try your new gun you ever saw let him have it you silly roared giraffe the fat boy heard all the clamor he also sighted the lumbering bear which after taking one good look at the approaching canoes turned to shuffle back again into the shelter of the protecting brush as though he did not much fancy any closer acquaintance with the two-legged occupants bumpus scrambled to his knees he was trembling like a leaf shaken in the gale but nevertheless managed to clumsily throw the double barrel to his shoulder after pulling back both hammers they saw him bend his chubby neck as though to sight along the barrels then a tremendous explosion occurred as though a young cannon had been fired and the next instant bumpus went over flat on his back among the duffel with which the canoe was loaded his feet coming into view as he landed among the blankets and the packages of food secured in the rubber ponchos to keep them from getting wet end of chapter one Chapter Two of the Boy Scouts in the Maine Woods. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Debbie R. Baker Robinson. The Boy Scouts in the Maine Woods by Herbert Carter. A warning from a game poacher. Did I get him? bumpus as he spoke these eager words managed to gain a sitting position though his first act was to rub his shoulder as though it pained him there was a roar from all the boys at this remark and indeed even the two main guides grinned more or less listen to the innocent would you shouted giraffe when his buckshot tore up the water halfway between the boat and the shore till it looked just like one of those spouting geysers we read about out in yellowstone park did he get him boys step hen put his hands to his mouth megaphone fashion and bawled out hey answer that mr bear please let the poor boy know whether he tickled your tough old hide with one of his buckshot because who knows fellows but what it might a glanced off the top of the water and landed and he winked at allen who was in the canoe with jim hasty close by i don't hear any answer floating back remarked tad and so we'll have to believe that either the bear is lying there stone dead or else has skipped out to safe quarters bears never can stand being fired at by cannon they tell me cannon burst out giraffe at this moment for he had managed to possess himself of the new gun by pointing to it and having eli crooks pass it along cannon well i should smile what do you think he did fellers just exactly what i warned him to be aware of when he saw a game and got excited pulled both triggers at the same time gee no wonder it knocked him over 
I'd hate to have been behind that charge myself, and I've stood a good many heavy ones. Ain't we going ashore to see if I did just happen to bowl that old bear over? whined Bumpus, looking appealingly at Tad. I'd never forgive myself, you see, if I found out that he had died, and no one even got a stake off him. A scout never wants to waste the good things of life like that, does he, Tad? But the scoutmaster shook his head. I guess there's no chance of that happening, Bumpus, he remarked. By now your bear is a quarter of a mile away from here and running yet. Don't blame him, said Step Hen. That new gun makes enough noise to burst your eardrums, Bumpus. And let's hope you won't ever pull both triggers again. Just practice putting one finger at a time in action. After you've shot the first barrel, let it just slip back to catch the second trigger. It's as easy as tumbling off a log. Or going over backward when you do bang away with both barrels at once, added Davy Jones wisely. As they were descending the river, the work was comparatively easy for the two guides. They would have their business cut out for them later on when their plan of campaign, looking toward reaching the Eagle Chain of Lakes, was more fully developed. In the beginning, there had been three of the paddlers in the party, but a telegram had caught them as they left the train, calling the Old Town Indian Sabattis home on account of the serious sickness of his wife. Tad was capable of assuming charge of one canoe with the assistance of Step Hen and Davy, both lusty fellows, and so they had not bothered trying to fill the gap at the last hour. The chances were that they might have had to take some fellow along who would turn out to be sullen or else a shirk, thus spoiling much of their pleasure on the trip. These members of the Silver Fox Patrol had reason to feel proud because each one of them was at that time wearing a trifling little badge that proved their right to call themselves assistant fire wardens, employed by the great state of Maine to forever keep an eye out for dangerous conflagrations and labor to extinguish the same before they could do much damage. It had come about in this manner. On the train, they had formed the acquaintance of a gentleman who turned out to be the chief fire warden on his way right then to patrol a certain district that nearly every year boasted of one or more severe fires. He was greatly interested in Tad's account of the numerous things a Boy Scout aspired to do each day, and, as it was his privilege to take on as many unpaid assistants as he chose, just as a sheriff may do in an emergency, the gentleman had with his own hands pinned a little badge on the lapel of each boy's coat. They were very proud of the honor and expressed their intention of serving as fire wardens to the best of their ability, all but Giraffe. He used to shake his head every time he glanced down at his badge and looked solemn. The fact of the matter was, Giraffe had all his life been so wrapped up in starting fires that the very idea of spending his precious time in helping to put one out did not appeal to him very strongly. Jim is telling me that we can expect to see the mouth of the Little Machias River any old time from now on, remarked Alan. And while I haven't come up this way exactly to the Eagle Waters, I guess he's about right. Sure he is, ventured Giraffe, for we passed the place where the big Machias joins forces with the Aroostooks some time back, and unless my eagle eye fails me, away up ahead I can see the junction right now where we turn to the left and leave this dandy old stream. Then the fun begins with the paddles. What was that the fire warden was saying to you, Tad, about some sort of bad man up in this region that give the game wardens more trouble than all the rest of the poachers combined? Step Hen asked. Jim Hasty was seen to squirm a little, and Tad noticed this as he answered the question. Oh, yes. He was warning me to steer clear of one Caleb Martin, a strapping big fellow who used to be first a logger and then one of those men who gets boats knees out of the swamps and marshes up here but who for some years has made up his mind to loaf and take toll of other people's traps or shoot game out of season caleb martin a eh? step hen went on seems to me it was another name from that well tad continued he did mention two others who were said to be cronies of the big poacher Let's see, I believe their names were Cy Kedge and Ed Harkness. Wasn't that it, Jim? And he turned suddenly on the smaller guide. That's right, answered the other promptly. Though, to be fair and square with you, I didn't hear him speaking of em at all. But I lived up here, you knows, and Cale, he's been a-keepin' the whole country kinder riled a long time now. I'm hoping we won't run across him any, and that's a fact. 
sounds like there wasn't much love lost between you and the same kale martin ventured tad the hain't was the only thing jim would say and tad knew there must be a story back of it which he hoped later on to hear but why should the wardens be afraid of just three men when they have the law on their side that's what i'd like to know bumpus demanded giraffe gave a scornful laugh the law don't count for a great deal away up in the wilderness bumpus he remarked in a condescending way all sorts of things are done when men get away off in the main woods they laugh at the law till they feel its hand on their shoulder and see the face of a warden close to theirs then perhaps they wilt but this bully of the big woods has had a free hand up yonder so long that he just thinks he's the boss of all creation he needs taken down i reckon and perhaps if we happen to run across him it might be the mission of the silver fox patrol to teach him a lesson queer things have happened as we all know looking back a little at our own experiences we don't want to brag remarked tad perhaps the shoe would be on the other foot and he might kick the lot of us out of his territory but all the same let's hope our trail won't cross that of kale martin they were presently turning in to the left and starting to ascend the little machias a pretty stream which some years back used to fairly teem with game fish but which like many another river in maine has felt the effect of the continual work of thousands of fishermen and worse than that the sly netting at the hands of lawless poachers step hen was interested in many things that opened to their view as they went on and his two companions did the paddling for he had been working quite some time himself and was entitled to a resting spell this was a new trait in step hen time had been when he would hardly notice a single thing when out in the woods unless his attention was especially directed to it by a comrade but it was so no longer and the way his awakening came about as mentioned in a previous story is worthy of being recorded again as showing what a trifling thing may start a boy to thinking and observing the myriad of interesting events that are constantly occurring around him no matter where he may happen to be at the time in a crowded city or alone in a vast solitude step hen had once come upon a humble little tumblebug striving to push a ball four times as big as himself up a forlorn road at a point where there was a thank you mum intended to throw the water aside during a heavy rain and save the road from being guttered he had grown so deeply interested in seeing the little creature try again and again to overcome the stupendous difficulties that faced it that he lay there for half an hour watching clapping his hands when he thought success had come and feeling deeply sorry when a slip caused the ball to roll back again often upsetting the bug and passing over its body the astonishing pluck of the humble little bug had aroused the admiration of the boy and in the end he had picked up both ball and bug and placed them safely above the baffling ascent in the road and after that hour step hen awoke to the fact that an observing boy need never lack for something intensely interesting to chain his attention no matter where he might be all he had to do was to keep his eyes open and look nature had ten thousand deeply interesting and curious things that appeal to the one who knows how to enjoy them and so from that day step hen was noticed to be eagerly on the watch for new sights he asked many questions that proved his mind had awakened and tad knew that that half hour when the scout had lain alongside the mountain road down in north carolina had possibly been the turning point in his career for he would never again be the same old careless indifferent step hen of the past there comes another canoe down the river suddenly cried bumpus who was still squatting in the bow of the leading canoe industriously rubbing his right shoulder as though it pained him considerably a fact tad noticed and which had caused him to promise that he would take a look at the lame part when they stopped for their midday meal very soon now there was only one man in the canoe that was approaching and presently jim hasty remarked that he knew him it's sure hen perry from up where i used to hold out he went on to say and then called out to the approaching main guide as his makeup pronounced the other to be hello hen had ye glad to see ye come closer and shake hands how's everybody up to the old place the other dark-faced fellow seemed pleased to his old friend and immediately gripped the extended hand guess they're putty well up thar jim and no need am i askin how you been cause you're lookin prime he remarked and then suddenly an expression akin to dismay flashed across his weather-beaten face as he continued 
By the same token, I got a message for you, Jim, in case I run up again you on my way down to Squapan, where I got her meet a party that's bound up hunting. You won't like to hear it neither, I kinder guess, cause it's from a feller you got no use for. Cale Martin burst involuntarily from the lips of Jim Hasty, while his face turned a shade wider under his coat of tan. Their same critter, Ham went on. He's still running things to suit hisself up thar around the eagle chain, and larfin at all their game wardens in Urstook County to stop him a having his way. Why should he tell you anything to say to me? And how'd he know I was a-coming up of this a-ways? asked Jim firmly. He says as how he heard that you was a-going to bring a pack of boys along up to the eagles. Perhaps it came in a letter he hid from somebody. I don't know just how that might be. But he seemed to know it all right, Jim. Says he to me, Hen, if you happens to run across that there measly little skunk what sells by the name of Jim Hasty, just you tell him for me that if he dares to put his foot up here in my district, I'm bound to pin his ears to a tree and leave him thar to give him a lesson. And Jim, I guess from the look he had on that black face of him when he says that, Kale meant it, every blessed word. And if twas me, I'd feel like turning back to take my people another way. Tad fixed his eyes on Jim's face to see how the shorter guide took it. He realized that Jim was at least no coward, even though he might fear the wrath of such a forest bully as the ex-logger, and present lawless poacher Cale Martin. For he had shut his teeth hard together, and there was a grim expression on his face, as if he did not mean to knuckle under to any such base threat as that. End of chapter 2「Chapter Three of the Boy Scouts in the Maine Woods. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Debbie R. Baker Robinson. The Boy Scouts in the Maine Woods by Herbert Carter. The Maker of Fires. How about that, Jim? Must we turn around and go back? Just because this feller that thinks he owns the whole north of Maine says so, asked Giraffe, who was really a fearless sort of lad and could not bear to be ordered around by a bully. Jim was looking a little peaked, nor could Tad blame him after hearing what a terror this Caleb Martin had been in the community for years, and how even the officers of the law had never as yet dared arrest him, even though there were rewards out for each one of the three men. No, nah, we don't turn back if I knows it, said Jim doggedly. Bully for you, Jim, exclaimed Step Hen eagerly. There's eight of us, all told, in the party, and I think for my part that it's a pretty how-do-you-do now if we can't stand up for our rights against just three cowards. I call them that because all bullies are when you come right down to it. My father says so, and I've seen it among the boys in school. Yes, Jim, remarked Bumpus with a grand air though he immediately made a grimace as a quick movement gave his sore shoulder a wrench. We're going to stand by you, through thick and thin, ain't we, fellers? Eight guns in the crowd, remarked Davy Jones with an air of confidence. Sure, we ought to hold the fort and then some if deadly weapons count for anything up here, and I'm told they do. Perhaps, instead of pinning your ears to a tree, Jim, this same Mr. Kale will consent to walk back with us and give himself up to a game warden of the great and glorious state of Maine. We mustn't forget that we're all sworn-in officers of the said state and bound to assist any game warden who is trying to do his duty and earn his salary. Presently, the other guide said goodbye and, turning his canoe downstream, shot away with the current, while the scouts headed up further toward the wilderness that lay around the country of the Eagle Chain of Lakes, close to the northern border of the state. They landed presently to have a bite at noon. Tad took advantage of the opportunity to look at Bumpus's shoulder, as he anticipated, he found that there was quite an ugly black and blue bruise there, which would cause the boy considerable pain for several days, though he declared that nothing was going to keep him from practicing with his new gun, which seemed like a toy in the hands of a child. I'm sure you could not have held the butt close against your shoulder when you fired, Tad ventured as his opinion. That's just what, admitted the other with a sigh. No better next time, though, Tad, and thank you for making it feel easier but I wish I'd got that bear. How fine it would be to eat steak from a big bear I'd killed with the first shot from my new gun. 
make that plural bumpus for you fired both barrels remember laughed tad they were soon on the move again and pushing steadily up against the current of the little machias an hour or two passed the air was not nipping cold at this time of the day but as the season was now considerably advanced they expected to meet with considerable frost and even some ice before coming back once more to the home town lest the reader who has not made the acquaintance of the boy scouts in the previous volume should think it strange that these six lads were able to be away from their school duties for such a length of time at this season of the year it may be best to enter a little explanation right here an unfortunate epidemic of contagious sickness had broken out in cranford and as a number of the scholars of the school were affected the trustees had reluctantly decided that the session between early fall and new year's must be abandoned if all were well at the later date after the usual holidays school would be resumed but the health of the community demanded that the boys and girls be separated for the time being just then tad's guardian a genial old man who was known far and wide as daddy brewster found that he had an urgent need of communicating with a gentleman by the name of carson who had recently gone up into maine on his annual moose hunt in the big game country as he might not come out before january and the necessity of giving him certain documents was great tad had been asked to make the trip they had long been counting on a chance to visit the home country of their main fellow scout alan hollister and most of the scouts eagerly seized on this opportunity to carry out the project though two of the patrol were unable to be along and so they were now in a condition to thoroughly enjoy the outing since tad had carried out his mission and given the papers into the keeping of mr carson receiving a message in return which he had wired to the old gentleman when in touch with the telegraph station tad himself had believed that there was not the slightest cloud along the horizon and now that this kale martin business had cropped up he began to realize that after all it might not be such clear sailing as they had figured on still tad was not the one to borrow trouble though ready to grapple with it in any shape or manner once it found them out they camped early on that night because all of them were a little tired and the location on the shore looked especially fine hey look what giraffe's going to do exclaimed bumpus after they had carried part of their things ashore and were busily engaged in putting up the two big tents supplied by jim hasty from his camp stores such as all maine guides delight to possess why ain't it a part of my business to start the fire every time demanded the party in question who was on his knees didn't tad promise me that job if i'd keep on being careful about starting fires every which way i ain't had a blessed match on my person since i gave that promise have i tad and what's wrong about my getting the blaze in my own way tell me that bumpus but we want supper and we don't mean to sit around here an hour or two just watching you tinker with that silly old bow and stick twirling away like you had to saw through to china how about that tad and bumpus turned appealingly toward the patrol leader well knowing that whatever he said would go bumpus is right giraffe the other said kindly but firmly you're welcome to spend all the time you want with that contraption after you've started our cooking fire but it wouldn't be fair to hold up the whole bunch just to please yourself your own good sense tells you that giraffe giraffe of course had to appear to be convinced just when i had a new scheme in my head too that i just know would have made the fire come he grumbled as he hung the little bow on a twig of a tree nearby and produced flint and steel and a little bag in which he kept tinder in the shape of tiny shavings which he was always preparing at odd moments and before i get another chance to try it i'll have forgotten the combination sure but that's always the way it goes though don't you dare think bumpus hawtree that i'm going to give up so easy i'll fight it out this way if it takes all winter being an adept with flint and steel giraffe quickly had his fire started and that's the way it'll be after i've just got that one little snag past he took occasion to remark for the benefit of the fat scout who was hovering nearby everything's easy as tumbling off a log once you know how perhaps you remember what a time you had learning to ride a bike and yet now you can cut around corners and even stand on the saddle while she's going well you wait and see my smoke <laughs> that's all i ever will see i'm afraid chuckled bumpus but presently giraffe managed to drift into a more amiable humor 
that was when the coffee-pot was bubbling on the fire sending out its cheery aroma and the last of the eggs they had managed to buy from a potato grower on the bank of the aroostook were sizzling in the two large frying pans most boys possess hearty appetites and giraffe was no exception to the rule indeed like most lean fellows he had an enormous stowage capacity somewhere about him and could dispose of more food on occasion than any two of his mates bumpus always declared he had hollow legs and used them for receptacles when other places were filled to overflowing but not one of the scouts could remember the time when giraffe complained of having eaten too much like the crowded street car there was always room for more wish we'd struck this section of country an hour or two before dark bumpus ventured to remark complacently as he sat there with his fat legs doubled under him tailor fashion and munching at the crackers and cheese he had made a sandwich out of for why asked giraffe looking up oh a feller might have just taken a little turn around here and knocked over a deer or something of the sort bumpus replied with the utmost assurance in the world just as though such a thing were of common occurrence in his life looks right gamey around here how's that tad oh jim hasty told us that much declared step hen before the scoutmaster could find a chance to say anything didn't you hear him tell how every season there's been a moose or two killed within ten miles of where we've got our camp right now but we can't hold up yet to do any hunting so you'll just have to put a crimp in that sporting spirit you've developed so suddenly bumpus listen to him talk would you exclaimed giraffe and only a little while back you couldn't get bumpus to even touch a gun say you're a marble all right bumpus they'll have you set up as the eighth wonder of the world soon ahead of the telephone wireless moving pictures and even the talking machine edison and all the rest of those old wizards had better take a back seat when you come around joking and chatting they made the time pass very happily if jim hasty were in reality much concerned over the prospect of his meeting with the ugly poacher who had a bone to pick with him he at least did not show it outwardly any longer but then jim was a man of few words as a rule and it was hardly to be expected that so hardy a fellow would tremble just at the mention of a name there was room for them all under the shelter of the tents though as a rule so long as the weather kept on being fairly pleasant the two hardy guys declared that they much preferred to wrap up in their blankets and sleep under the stars such men become used to what would seem hardships to the city-bred person and in truth think very little of enduring them and it was by no means cold enough as yet to drive them into taking shelter under the canvas giraffe had been working away at his fire-making business pretty much all of the evening and bumpus had watched him for a while but growing tired of seeing the other sawing away as if for dear life he had finally laughed and turned away if giraffe came near making things go that evening at least once more the glory of a full success slipped away from his eager hands outstretched to clutch it for when it came time for them to shut up shop as tad said and crawl into the two tents he had not brought about his expected blaze though his face looked more determined than ever bumpus giraffe and allen occupied one tent while the other three scouts were assigned to the second the guides promised to share their shelter only in case of a storm or very severe weather the fire was allowed to die down if any strong wind came up in the night it would be the duty of the guides to see that burning brands were not carried into the adjacent woods to set fire to the brown pine needles that covered the ground and were so full of resinous matter that once ignited they would send a wall of flame down the wind that would do incalculable damage soon quiet rested over the camp the frosty night breeze sighed among the branches overhead the owl hooted to its mate deep in the wood and the hour of midnight when tad peeped forth and which he knew to have arrived from the position of certain stars overhead saw the last of the fire vanishing in dead embers tad sought the warmth of his blanket again in a hurry for the air was now nipping cold especially after the snug nest had been temporarily abandoned and he must have gone right to sleep for he did not seem to remember anything after again creeping under the double folds of the warm woolen covering now when one sleeps like most boys do soundly it is impossible to figure how time passes when awakened in a hurry 
so that tad could not tell what the hour might be when he found himself starting up hurriedly under the conviction that strange as it might seem at that season of the year and with the air frosty there was a storm bearing down upon them for he thought it was thunder he heard then came a tremendous crash and the tent swayed but did not fall though from the wild shouts that arose close at hand the young patrol leader reckoned the same good fortune could not have befallen the other shelter because he could plainly catch the howls of step hen bumpus and giraffe quick as a thought tad whirled over to the exit and crawled out and what his eyes beheld was enough to startle anybody let alone a boy if a genuine cyclone had not struck the camp on the little machias then something almost as bad must have dropped down upon them tad thought as he stared hardly able to believe his eyes or understand what it all meant end of chapter three chapter four of the boy scouts in the maine woods this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by debbie r baker robinson the boy scouts in the maine woods by herbert carter a terror that came in the night why the second tent had utterly left the place where tad remembered they had erected it he had just a fleeting glimpse of something dingy white careering along over the ground among the trees and then it vanished but there was a high time going on near by where the contents of the interior of the late tent were scattered around blankets heaved and legs were thrust out while the owners of the same were screaming at the top of their voices oh what is this bellowed bumpus who seemed to be almost smothered under the folds of his blanket which he must have had up over his head at the time the catastrophe came upon them it's a hurricane that's what and our bally old tent has been carried away shouted giraffe hang on to anything you can grab fellers or you may be taken next whoop let her come i've got hold of a tree now not much you have remarked tad that's my leg you're hanging on to let go and we'll soon find out what happened ain't it a storm after all then demanded step hen as he came creeping out under the canvas of the back of the one tent that had been left standing with most of his clothes hugged tightly in his grip as though he did not mean to be utterly left without something to keep him warm if the worst had befallen them tad had by now gleaned an inkling of the truth and it was so utterly ridiculous that he felt as though he must soon burst into peals of laughter first tell me if anybody was hurt he demanded feeling that it would be wrong to show any merriment if such should prove to be the case i don't know remarked giraffe seemed to me something heavy came squashed down on top of me like a thousand of bricks maybe it was only the tent pole falling guess i ain't hurt much how about you allan asked tad hardly thinking it worth while to ask bumpus who seemed to be all right though he was already beginning to dance around as the nipping fingers of jack frost got busy with his thinly covered shanks about which he had only his flimsy pajamas over his underclothes never happened to step on me though he came within three inches of my back replied the maine boy and there was something about his words to tell that allan must already have guessed what had been the cause for all this commotion and the stealing of their tent bumpus caught at the words what's all that he demanded quickly was it the work of some mean feller after all hey is that the way your old kale martin gets in his work sneaking up in the dead of night when we're all asleep and as innocent as the babes in the woods and snatching off our covers before you could wink an eye or say jack robinson well i like his nerve that's what and he'd better look out how he keeps on trying tricks on travelers say he switched our tent too and bumpus gave a whistle as well as his trembling lips would allow to emphasize his disgust you can thank your lucky stars old fellow said allan that he didn't plant one of his hoofs square on your stomach hoofs echoed bumpus aghast say then it wasn't that old poacher after all was it hoofs that must mean it was an animal looky here somebody get the fire started again so we won't shake to pieces while we're hunting our clothes and listening to the explanation of this latest outrage oh let davy do it said giraffe i'm nearly frozen stiff myself right now and besides he added as a brilliant afterthought you know i don't carry matches with me any more and of course you wouldn't want to wait while i swung my little bow where's my left shoe shouted step hen just then 
for there never was a time when he could find all his belongings and in a case of excitement like this it was a certainty that his customary complaint would soon be heard in the land who's gone and took my left shoe i'm dead certain i had both of em when i started to crawl under the canvas somebody thinks it's smart to keep playing jokes on me all the time why can't they let my things be tad what's that sticking out of the pocket of your coat asked allan as davy managed to strike a match and apply the fire to the only lantern they carried with them on the trip why whoever stuck that in there step hen went on unblushingly thinks it's smart to do such silly things and have me guessing all the time just switch off and try it on one of the others won't you knowing that he must have undoubtedly placed the shoe in that pocket himself in the haste of his departure from the tent that remained step hen did not dare accuse any one in particular but glared around at vacancy when thus addressing his supposed to be enemy but they were so accustomed to his failings by now that no one paid much attention to what he was saying in fact it would have been a cause for astonishment if twenty-four hours ever slipped past without an outburst from step hen in connection with some of his personal belongings that seemed to have taken wings in the most mysterious fashion and vanished although they always turned up again but what sort of an animal was it tad asked bumpus still dancing about and slapping himself in every conceivable place in order to keep his blood in circulation ask jim or eli replied the patrol leader who was really too busy just then getting some of his own clothes to bother answering so the others turned to the two guides who not having removed any of their ordinary garments did not feel the chilly night air as much as the lads what was it banged over us eli asked bumpus moose bull on the rampage replied the main woodsman readily enough a great big moose like that one we shot a while ago echoed bumpus showing great excitement just my luck why if he'd heard that i had a new gun and was waiting to see what it could do he couldn't have been kinder just knocked at our door and when nobody answered him he went away again and by jinx carried the door and the rest of the house with him however in the wide world do you suppose that happened eli i guess you ought to know because you're acquainted with the queer ways of these woods critters never knew such a thing before in all my experience in the woods asserted the older guide shaking his head fire was out wind blowing wrong way for moose to smell human critters and he must have thought he heard another bull on the edge of their water wanting to fight him anyhow he just naturally tore right through that tent it got fast to his horns and he's been and carried it off oh what tough luck if i'd only been on the watch i'd have the honor of shooting the first moose that took to wearing clothes human way groaned bumpus do you suppose then he's keeping our bolly tent and won't we ever set eyes on the same again asked giraffe holding his chilled hands out toward the fire that in davy's charge had been revived again until it sent out a genial warmth soon no remarked jim who had a personal interest in the matter seeing that the purloined canvas belonged to him though of course he knew that his employers would stand for any loss he incurred while working in their service he took the lantern and started away tad had managed to get some of his clothes on by this time and he hurried after the shorter guide who seemed to know exactly in which direction to pursue his investigations i can see something ahead there tad remarked presently that's the tent all right remarked jim i only hopes as how she ain't too bad cut up now twas nearly new and good and stout so i guess the old chap he had some trouble getting loose from the same they found the tent where it had caught on a sprout and torn free from the branching antlers of the moose commonly called his horns not so bad after all remarked jim when he had examined the extent of the damage made by the tents being so forcibly carried off i can patch it up easy when i gets a chance in the boat to marry guess as how we got off right smart all things considering tad and the young scoutmaster was ready to echo these words when he got to thinking how one of a dozen things might have accompanied the mad rush of the moose through the camp they never did know what had really caused his charge whether some vindictive spirit of rage provoked the huge beast or that he fancied a rival bull were challenging him to mortal combat just as in the case of the fellow whom sabattis had previously lured within gunshot with his seductive moose call the balance of the night gave them only broken sleep because of the sudden and rude shock of this awakening bumpus hugged his new gun close to his side and raised his head so often to listen 
that both giraffe and allen vowed they would be compelled to chase him outside if he didn't get busy and capture some sleep right away morning came in due time and they found that little damage had been done by the rush of the moose beyond some rents in the canvas of the tent once more they started forth and all that day plodded on making many miles and by evening reaching the spot where jim said they could have their canoes and luggage carried over to portage lake by a man he knew who owned a team and a wagon how far is it across from here asked tad seeking information depends on what way you go thar replied jim but i guesses as nick he likes the three mile carry best start fresh in the morning sure after they had partaken of an early supper jim went off to find his friend who owned the team while the others busied themselves getting their belongings in as small a compass as possible looking forward to what was expected to happen on the following morning later when jim came back he reported that he had interviewed nick and made all necessary arrangements with him to take the three canoes and the stuff that went with them across the carry in the morning the boys were expected to walk and if necessary push at the wheels of the wagon should it get stuck in a creek bed of soft quicksand the night passed quietly and all hands managed to put in plenty of time sleeping to make up for the loss of the previous one in the morning the loud whoa of a stentorian voice announced the arrival of the expected team they proved to be oxen instead of horses and once the canoes and other stuff had been loaded on the big low wagon the journey commenced slow progress was the order of the day giraffe grumbled but it did no good and it was really noon when they finally came in sight of the lake the canoes were gladly launched a light lunch eaten the teamster paid off and then again the voyage was resumed under a favoring sky for the air was bracing and so far not a sign of the first snowstorm had made its appearance though the guides warned their charges to be prepared for the worst as a downfall was nearly due a cold wind was blowing from the northwest so that the wise guides hugged the sheltered shore of portage lake since the waves were of pretty good size and the flying spray would be far from pleasant in such weather finally they reached the place where the lake had its outlet into a small stream that after flowing for a number of miles emptied into the lower lake of the great and famous eagle chain on the shore of this lake then they made their next camp from the grave manner of jim the scoutmaster easily guessed that they must by now have entered the territory where cale martin the slippery old poacher held forth jim seemed to look about him more than before he also started at the least unusual sound showing that while he might try to disguise the fact he was really nervous still he did not give the slightest indication of showing the white feather or backing down before a dozen like cale martin davy had purchased a little snapshot camera at the town below and also some flashlight cartridges with which he wished to get some views of the group around the campfire at night no one had made any effort to perpetuate such scenes which davy declared were the very best part of the whole trip and now that they had become fairly launched upon the journey he was aching to start into business with his new outfit davy knew a little about taking pictures although far from being an expert he had never used flashlight powders or cartridges before and after reading all the directions carefully he declared he felt prepared to take a picture that would be viewed with the greatest satisfaction in the world by all his chums when this great main vacation were only a memory of the past so davy warned his campmates not to be alarmed if there suddenly flashed upon them a great light i'd like to get you all in characteristic attitudes if i could that was the way the feller who sold me the camera called it and he said the best pictures were the natural ones what i mean is that if i could grab step hen here for instance with that silly look of his on his face saying anybody seen my camp hatchet around funny how it's always my things that get carried off the jinx never hides anything belonging to you fellers i'd have something worth while oh come off it will you davy if i thought i looked like you say i'd let all my traps disappear every day but what i'd kick up a row and step hen assumed an air of indignation with these words that caused a general laugh to go around of course it had to be explained to the two guides for they were to be in the picture smoking their pipes contentedly and apparently eli telling a story to which the rest of the scouts were listening eagerly possibly laughing having fixed things to his satisfaction davy disappeared slipping away from the campfire on the side he had decided upon as offering the best natural advantages for a flashlight view 
they could not see him but guessed that he was working his way toward them as slyly as he could since he had announced that he meant to play the part of an enemy stealing up to spy upon the camp presently they did manage to get eli started telling a story for tad knew it would be better for the picture if the guide seemed natural and not on parade meanwhile davy was creeping forward intent on reaching the place he had picked out beforehand and where without exposing himself he could set his camera and then fire the cartridge when to his uneducated mind in the line of photography davy had things just about to his liking he held himself in readiness for what he deemed an extra fine view when the boys were laughing heartily at the climax of eli's queer story of a scrape he once found himself in that was really humorous though at the time it may have appeared anything but that to the actor now said davy partly to himself as he fired his cartridge there was a sudden brilliant and dazzling flash that must have been as fierce as the display of lightning when the bolt hits close at hand and while those at the fire were schooled to repress their natural alarm evidently the same could not be said of a looker-on not counted in the bill for there was a hoarse cry of alarm from the bushes across the way and the sound of crashing seemed to tell of a precipitate flight end of chapter four recording by debbie r baker robinson Chapter Five of the Boy Scouts in the Maine Woods. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Debbie R. Baker Robinson. The Boy Scouts in the Maine Woods by Herbert Carter. Jim's Secret. What was that? exclaimed Bumpus. Oh, Davy just had to let out a hoop, commented Step Hen think again would you spoke up giraffe who sat there twisting his long neck this way and that in a comical way as though seeking to discover the object of the strange outcry it came from the other side of the camp from where davy is well said the indifferent step hen as if not wanting to be bothered that it must have been some animal that was curious enough to prowl around our camp and got a good scare free gratis for nothing it was no animal that made that sound and i leave it to tad or allen here bumpus insisted indeed even the sleepy step hen sat up and took notice that the two mentioned as well as jim and eli were already on their feet exchanging significant looks words were hardly needed to proclaim that they deemed the circumstances one worthy of investigation just then davy came in bearing his little camera and with a grin on his face got a fine picture that time i reckon fellers he announced after the manner of satisfied camera fiends the world over did you give a shout davy asked tad thinking it best to settle that point in the start before going any further not that i know of i didn't immediately replied the other did you hear one continued the patrol leader sure i did and took it for granted that step hen or giraffe had been scared by the fireworks display in spite of my warning and squealed davy replied that settles it then tad went on turning to eli and jim get a torch or the lantern and we'll see what it was wow this looks some interesting exclaimed giraffe beginning to show signs of excitement himself eli picked up the lantern and lighted it then he led the way into the bushes at the exact spot where according to his educated ear the snort and the crash had come from keep back the rest of you said tad and let eli do the looking if he finds anything worth while be sure you'll all know about it a minute later the old guide called to them to come on bully for eli he's lost no time in making good exclaimed giraffe the whole party crowded around the old guide who was on his knees on the ground apparently examining some tracks he had found he waved a hand to keep them from crowding too close to him so as to interfere with his work bending low tad could easily see the marks someone had been crouching there in the bushes and spying on the camp that he could not be an honest woodsman it was easy to guess for as such he would have stalked straight into camp sure of the warm welcome that is always extended to a stranger who looks good eli pointed to the impression close to the footprints there's where he rested the butt of his rifle he said positively and tad knew it was exactly as eli declared just as though he could himself see the actions of the hidden man got on his knees and crawled up to whar he could poke his nose out in the scrub yar and watch us and yar is where he was restin on just one knee 
because you can see the mark o his foot beyond what was he doing that for asked tad though deep down in his heart he seemed to instinctively know well i kind of guess now that he might have been a trying to see how he could kiver one of us with his gun replied eli he beckoned to jim and that worthy approached there was a troubled look on the face of the younger guide that tad could not but notice and he realized that the affair might not be so great a mystery to jim as it seemed to the rest of them take a squint at them hood tracks here jim perhaps you might sort of recognize the same eli remarked dryly jim only needed that one glance and then he gritted his teeth as he observed oh twar him all right eli i knowed it wow and again i say wow this here is sure getting mighty interesting muttered giraffe shuffling uneasily from one foot to the other while bumpus filled with a sudden alarm started back into the camp to arm himself with his new gun do you mean old kale martin demanded tad none other answered jim moodily then he must have seen you jim sitting here the patrol leader went on he sure did replied the short guide and amused himself covering you with his gun just as if to say that he could put a bullet in you if so be he wanted but he didn't want to did he jim reckon he didn't sir the other ventured you see he ain't just that mad at me so's to want to kill me just says as how i got to keep away from where he camps you know still he said he meant to pin your ears to a tree if he caught you up here those were about the words your guide friend hen perry used weren't they jim that's what they was and he meant it too jim replied that's one of his good points that he allers keeps his word if them game wardens could ever get old dad martin to say as he never would kill game out in season again they'd know nothing under the sun tempt him to do it not even if he was dying for a bit of meat he ain't all bad this here cal martin but what about you jim seems to me this is taking big chances in your coming up here when such a lawless character has a grudge against you and is waiting to put his stamp on you that way and strikes me jim that you must have had a motive in coming that was more than just bluff how about that the young guide glanced at tad when he said this and evidently realized that the patrol leader could read his mind better than most people he looked a little confused then gave a short nervous laugh and said well now since you sized me up that way i'll just have to admit that i did have a notion in coming up here sides taking you through the eagle lakes i had my orders to come and from one as i has to mind he turned away while speaking as though not inclined to say more just then in the presence of so many but tad made up his mind that there was a story back of the strange actions of jim and that a few point-blank questions might bring it out before he slept he hoped he would find a chance to get jim to one side and ask him about it for he had reason to believe the other was ready to confide in him do you think he'll come back again tonight asked davy jones who cares remarked a voice at the elbow of the speaker and turning they beheld bumpus flourishing his new double-barrel gun as though only too anxious for a chance to hold somebody up at its muzzle here you keep that cannon aimed the other way if you please cried giraffe dodging behind a convenient tree you ought to be marked with a red flag dangerous dynamite that's what i think come let's get back to camp remarked tad there's little chance of old kale coming back here tonight he got the scare of his life when that flashlight burst on him so sudden-like i wouldn't be surprised if he thought a rapid-fire machine-gun was opening on him or else that lightning had taken to camping on his trail anyhow remarked allan he just couldn't help turning and running as if the old nick were after him and from that we can guess that kale never heard tell of flashlight pictures well can you blame him asked tad makes me think of the old fable when the lion and the donkey went hunting together the lion took up his station at the mouth of the cave where some goats had hidden while the donkey went in and made all sorts of terrible noises braying so the goats ran out and the lion killed as many as he wanted when the donkey came out he asked his partner if he had done the job in good shape fine said the lion and you would have frightened me too if i hadn't known that you were only a donkey and that's the way with us fellows we were on to the game in advance or some of us might have taken to our heels too here that sounds mighty much like you were calling me a donkey remarked davy trying to display a certain amount of offended dignity oh not in the least laughed tad if the shoe fits put it on jeered giraffe 
You know they say that wherever you see smoke, there's sure to be fire. Not much there ain't, burst out Bumpus with a grin. I've seen heaps of smoke started without a sign of a blaze, and Giraffe subsided into silence, knowing what was meant. Did you get a good picture, Davy? asked Tad, as they once more settled down around the fire. Seemed like it to me, was the reply. It was just when you were all laughing at what Eli here was saying. He had his hand up like he was going to smack it down in the palm of the other to emphasize a telling point in his story. Say, wouldn't it be a great stunt now if, when I developed that plate, I found a face sticking out of the bushes across yonder, and Jim here recognized it as belonging to that big terror of the pine woods, Kale Martin. Say, that would be just great, ejaculated Step Hen, and all eyes were turned toward Jim, but that worthy made no remark, though he must have surely heard what was said. As the evening grew on apace, Tad was watching for the chance he wanted to get a few words in private with the younger guide. Jim somehow had interested Tad from the start. He never said anything about himself or his folks, but somehow the young patrol leader had been drawn toward Jim. He believed the fellow to be a sturdy chap, clean and honest as any guide ever employed by big game hunters in the Maine woods. And now that it began to appear that there was a little mystery attached to his past, of course Tad felt a deeper interest in Jim than ever. Perhaps it was accident that took Jim off after a while, he may have just wanted to smoke his pipe alone and ponder on the strange fate that seemed to throw him once more in contact with the man who had crossed his life trail in the past, and apparently not in a pleasant way either. But somehow, Tad conceived an idea that Jim just knew he wanted to have a quiet little chat with him and was thus making an opening. Just as he had expected, he found the guide leaning against a tree nearby. The light from the flickering blaze of the campfire reached the spot, but faintly and Jim did not even show any signs of nervousness when Tad drew near, which was one indication that he had half expected his coming. Perhaps Jim even invited a chance to bestow his confidence on the young scoutmaster. He must have seen before now that Tad Brewster was no ordinary boy, and when a man has been brooding over something a long time, he often feels like having a friend to whom he may pour out the troubles of his soul, and from whom perhaps he may look for advice. Not thinking of changing your mind, are you, Jim? asked Tad as he joined the other by the tree. If you mean about going back and feeling like a whipped hound dog, sir, tain't in Jim Hasty to do that always. Fact is, the guide went on with a stubborn ring in his voice, meeting up with old Kale just kinder makes me more sot in my mind than ever. I stays with you right through, you can bank on that. Well, I only hope he'll conclude to give us a wide berth and make up his mind that he'd better keep his hands off, Tad went on. Seems like he doesn't fancy you any too much, Jim. This was a plain invitation, and the other so regarded it, for he immediately answered. I kind of guess old Kale does hate me worse nor pison, sir. Perhaps he's got reason for it, and again, maybe he ain't. Tall depends on the way you look at it. I only done what any man of spirit had done, if so be he found himself up again a stone wall like Cale Martin's no, not on your life, meant. Then you asked him for something, did you, Jim? Just what I done, sir, which something wore what he happened to care more for than anything else on the earth, Jim replied, and Tad could detect something soft and tender underneath the words that gave him a clue. And that something, Jim, he went on invitingly, or his daughter, little Lena, their purtiest and sweetest gal in all the Maine woods, the guide made answer, when he says as how I never could have her with all her caring for me so much, I just up and run away with her, and that's why old Kale, he hates me worse than a coral python. End of chapter 5「Chapter 6 of the Boy Scouts in the Maine Woods this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Debbie R. Baker Robinson. The Boy Scouts in the Maine Woods by Herbert Carter. Taking a Risk for the Sake of Little Lena. Tad understood it all now, and the knowledge gave him a thrill. He thrust out his hand to the young guide with boyish enthusiasm. Shake, Jim, he exclaimed. I just know you did what any decent man would have done. And so you managed to run away with the old man's daughter, did you? Was she all he had? 
only a little Ina, and he believed the sun rose and set in her like. They could all say as Cale Martin wore a bad man, and he wore rough as they make em sometimes, but he'd a laid down his life for that gal any day. I was dead sorry to have to do it, but I know he'd never give in, and I just couldn't live without her. We got out in this district when Cale wore off on a hunt, and I ain't never seen hide a hair of him since but he sent me word that if so be I ever came back to the old stomping grounds, he had had it in for me all right. How long ago was that, Jim? Nigh a year and a half now, the other replied. And of course your wife has often wished she could see her father again, Jim? The guide groaned. Cried her putty eyes out, I wanting to see her dad, he admitted. But what could a man do about it if Cale, he wouldn't forgive me? He sent word as how Lena could come back, but me never and in course she wouldn't quit me but now jim tell me about who gave you the orders you were saying something about a while ago pursued tad she done it in course answered the other heaving a sigh i knowed the risk i were taking but i'd do a right smart more for my lena then as i take it jim you don't really want to avoid old kale this fiery father-in-law of yours in fact you mean to see him face to face got her replied the other laconically cause she says so it may be i can do it on the way up to the lakes but if not then i'm a-coming back with eli and the canoes this a ways arter y'all gets aboard your train and i'll hang out around this district until we meets never dar show myself to her lest i done everything and gone to carry it out and don't you feel a little uneasy about your ears jim well it wouldn't be just the nicest thing i gone to lose em but she says as how old kale he's bound to cave when he hears what i got her tell him evidently jim had said all he meant to and tad took the hint well all i want to say is that i admire your nerve jim and the lot of us will stand back of you if you get in any trouble he remarked earnestly it's right nice in you to say that sir and i sure predate it the guide went on to say with a tremor in his voice but arter all i guess there ain't going to be any row if me and kale we kims together i'm willing to risk it but i must say is how i don't like the ig of him that sat in and them bushes aiming his gun at me but cal martin's a square man as wouldn't shoot down another without giving him a show and i guess he just done it for fun so tad went back to the fire and sat down but he did not join in the merry talk that was going around his thoughts were wholly given up to jim and his story he liked the short guide more than ever and in the same proportion detested the big main backwoodsman whose daughter jim had run away with presently some of the boys complained of feeling sleepy and arrangements were made for passing the night both jim and eli declared that it would be only the part of wisdom to keep watch there could be no telling what deviltry kale martin assisted by his two congenial spirits cy kedge and ed harkness might attempt to do perhaps thinking that it would reflect on the guides if they annoyed the party whom eli and jim were convoying into the main woods they might even try to set fire to the camp and thus spoil the entire trip when morning came tad and allan had taken their turn at standing sentry but none of the other scouts were called upon because the leader did not have the greatest of confidence in their ability to remain awake not to mention hearing and comprehending any sounds that might arise and which spelled danger a consultation in the morning showed that only once had there been heard suspicious sounds it was while allan held the fort and he declared that to the best of his knowledge they were far distant voices on the river but although he listened carefully and was prepared to give the alarm if necessary nothing further developed that might be considered a peril to the camp the boys were feeling pretty good that morning they had most of them enjoyed a fine sleep and were as active as young colts davy in particular seemed to be full of animal spirits and when he felt like it there was no end of the capers the athletic gymnast could do one minute he was hanging from his toes from a high limb looking like a monkey and the next he had let go whirled over three times in the air and landed lightly on his feet on the soft ground after which he would make his little bow just like the celebrated performer in the great and only barnum circus after he has thrilled the audience with one of his marvelous acts Bumpus sat and watched all these performances with open mouth. Secretly, the fat boy aspired to imitate Davy in some of his antics, though Giraffe always scoffed loudly at the absurd idea of a heavyweight like Bumpus trying to play the part of a nimble ape. Several times had the ambition of Bumpus got the better of his judgment, 
and he had endeavored to follow in the wake of the active member of the party but always with disastrous results so that for some time now he had taken it out in gaping and wishing and longing for the time to come when he could get rid of his surplus fat so that he might be nimble like davy giraffe during breakfast was unusually silent and sober tad guessed where his thoughts were straying and consequently it did not surprise him in the least to overhear the tall boy muttering to himself while he shook his head stubbornly i can do it all right i just know i can step hen amused himself watching a sharp-eyed little striped chipmunk stealing some bits thrown aside from the camp meal time was when step hen might have been guilty of trying to hit such a fair mark with a club or stone but that was in the past he would not have lifted a finger now to injure that innocent little creature for worlds but sat there deeply interested in observing every movement it made just as if it were a pet jim seemed to be himself again at least when tad looked toward him inquiringly the guide nodded his head and smiled evidently jim had slept over his trouble and decided that he was doing the right thing for the sake of little lena he was ready to go right along taking big chances of losing his precious ears for only too well did he know that old kale was a man of his word and that he must have meant everything he said to the messenger who bore the threat to jim Davy was wild to develop the film upon which he had taken that snapshot picture on the preceding night, but there were a number of obstacles in the way of doing that. First of all, there were five other exposures on that roll, as yet untouched, and as a clinching argument, Davy had not bothered bringing a developing tank or printing outfit along with him, fearing that they would take up too much room. And so he would have to be content to wait until they reached some place where a photographer held forth who would undertake to do the job for a consideration. Of course, the picture of that breakfast would hardly be complete without Step Hen suddenly breaking forth in his customary strain. Where's my. Oh, here it is on my head, of course. How queer that I should forget I put it there. And he had to actually take his hat off and look at it as if hardly able to believe his eyes, and that for once his anticipated difficulty had been smoothed over so easily. Davy joined in the general laugh that greeted this outbreak. Then he walked gravely over and insisted on feeling of Step Hen's neck. Hey, what are you up to now, you Jones boy? Keep your paws off me, exclaimed the object of this solicitude, suspiciously dodging i only wanted to make sure that the connection was still sound retorted the other because some fine day all of us expect you to lose your head well i've seen you lose yours more'n a few times when you got frustrated and excited and it didn't seem to hurt much step hen retorted there's a big difference in heads remarked davy i should say there was replied the other meaningly and the gray stuff that's in em too some are hollow like a pumpkin while others mine for instance are just crammed full of thinks well i'd advise you to use a few of the thinks trying to remember where you put your belongings and quit accusing the rest of us of playing tricks on you or a silly little jinx of stealing things davy went on shaking his finger at the careless scout if all you fellows are done eating perhaps we'd better get a move on us suggested the scoutmaster of course tad was really only the assistant for according to the regulations governing all troops of boy scouts connected with the parent organization there had to be a grown-up acting in the capacity of scoutmaster though tad had passed an examination that entitled him to receive his commission as assistant from the headquarters in new york city as this gentleman a dr philander hobbs had been unable to get away with them on this trip to maine he had relegated his authority to the shoulders of tad a proceeding that was greatly relished by the other five scouts because they liked to feel that they were depending on themselves with no grown-up along accordingly there was a movement among the campers tents had to come down and be stowed away and all the material connected with the cooking department made into as small a compass as possible all of them worked but giraffe who was on his knees nearby doing something that tad could easily guess the nature of knowing the stubborn qualities in the angular scout tad felt sure that none of them would know any peace until giraffe had finally managed to strike a clue and effect the end he had in view of making an actual bona fide fire after the way known to the south sea islanders with his little bow his sharp pointed stick set in a hole made in a block of wood and his inflammable tender backed by indomitable energy and get their spirit and for the sake of harmony in the camp tad really wished giraffe would hurry up and solve the knotty problem 
inside of half an hour they were all packed and ready to make another start in the direction of the eagle chain of lakes to the north end of chapter six chapter seven of the boy scouts in the maine woods this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Debbie R. Baker Robinson. The Boy Scouts in the Maine Woods by Herbert Carter. The Long Drawn Howl of a Canada Wolf. All ready, sang out Tad. Some of them were already settled in the canoes, but Giraffe still remained kneeling on the shore. Come, we've waited long enough for you, old Slowpoke, called out Bumpus, who was the partner of the tall scout in the canoe paddled by Eli very slowly did giraffe approach his eyes turned beseechingly on tad say that's the way it always goes he declared i was just getting on to it the best ever and if i only had half an hour more i'd made my fire as sure as i'm conrad steadman i've got her all figured out and by noon i'll be twisted in my mind again and the whole combination lost but tad only shook his head couldn't think of it number six he declared it was one part of the agreement made with you that on no occasion were you to delay the balance of the party. All ready, Bumpus, give the signal. Bumpus was a natural musician. He could play any old instrument and extract very good music from banjo, guitar, violin, or even an accordion. He also had a fine voice that often aroused the enthusiastic acclaim of his comrades while sitting around the fire of evenings of course then he had been made the bugler of the troop as soon as the organization was commenced it had not been deemed just the right thing for him to fetch his musical instrument along while the silver fox patrol chanced to be in the maid woods on a hunt but then that was no bar to bumpus who could put his hands to his mouth and give a splendid imitation of the reveille assembly taps or any other military call so giraffe had to climb into eli's canoe looking very much discouraged Really, it did seem as though an evil spirit took a special delight in baffling him, just when he seemed in a fair way to reach the goal of his present ambition. As he had once before complained, he had even had his tinder soaked by a sudden shower, and just at the critical moment when he felt sure it was about to burst into a successful blaze. But one thing was sure, these successive defeats only served to make him shut his teeth harder together, and resolve that nothing would ever prevent him from getting that fire if it took him a year. He might be beaten once, twice, or fifty times, but there would come a day to the patient plotter when the door of opportunity would open for him. And surely success would stand for a great deal more if he had to work like this for it than if easily attained. Before noon came, they had arrived at the place where the stream ran into the lower lake of the Eagle Chain, and when they stopped for lunch, it was upon the shore of this beautiful sheet of water. Tad had been secretly keeping an eye on Jim. He knew that the guide must feel more or less anxiety, despite his brave outward showing. And when Jim thought no one was observing, he would look out of the tail of his eye at every clump of bushes that seemed any way suspicious as long as they were upon the river. And hence, it was doubtless a positive relief when they started out on the broader water of the lake, for after that he would only have to watch one shore. About one o'clock they again started. The air continued cold but bracing, and this made paddling a pleasure, up to a certain point. All of the scouts took a hand at it, even Bumpus, and received more or less valuable instruction from the two guides, as to how the paddle should be worked in order to have as little lost motion as possible, and at the same time secure the greatest amount of benefit. But when after half an hour of labor they found their muscles beginning to tire from the unaccustomed motion, the boys considered themselves lucky to be able to turn the paddles over once more to the canoe men who were used to the job and could keep it up steadily all day if need be when they drew near the outlet where the waters of the lower lake flowed into lake winthrop tad happening to look back managed to discover a canoe skirting the shore some miles distant from the actions of those in it they seemed desirous of remaining unnoticed for they took advantage of every headland that jutted out and when they had to make across the open it was done with all possible speed tad did not need to be told who was in that craft and glancing toward jim he understood that the main guide had doubtless been aware of the pursuing canoe for some time because he nodded at the scoutmaster when he caught his eye it's him is it jim 
called out Tad, for the canoes were some thirty feet apart at the time. Yep, came the answer, accompanied by an affirmative nod of Jim's head. You know him, even at that distance, then, continued the patrol leader. He's working the paddle right now, replied the other. You can't mistake his way of swinging their spruce blade. Old Kale ain't got his equal at that in all the state of Maine. It was plain to be seen, then, that the giant poacher was on the trail of his detested son-in-law, possibly bent on carrying out his terrible threat, though Tad hoped such might not prove to be the case. He knew that often these rough men of the woods could appreciate true bravery, and that there might be a chance, however slight, that old Kale was lost in admiration for the recklessness that could induce Jim to brave his wrath. What if he had been consumed by a sudden deep curiosity to know what really caused the other to take the risk and come up here? Could he suspect that little Lena had sent a message to him? All these things gave Tad occasion for considerable thinking. At the same time, he did not mean to lose sight of the main reason for their having come so far from their homes in order to get some hunting and camping experience that would prove valuable to his fellow scouts anxious to learn all that they could at first hands of woodcraft. I'm glad we're as particular as we were about putting out the very last spark of fire this morning, Tad remarked as the canoes moved along close to one another. Why, demanded Giraffe a little suspiciously, for every time that magical word was used, he chose to think all eyes must be turned in his direction, just as though he should be placed in the same class with fire. Oh, because the wind came up like great guns shortly after we left camp, Tad went on, always ready to point a lesson to those under him and from the river, too. Now, if we'd left any fire there, the chances are it would have been picked up and thrown into the woods. As there was a lot of dry stuff around, you can see how easy a fire starts up here, and when it gets going, I reckon it can burn some. Eh, Alan? If you ever have the good or bad luck to run across a forest of fire while we're up in this section, you'll see a sight that none of you'll soon forget, and he had to cast a meaning glance as he spoke in the direction of the fire worshipper but Giraffe only smiled in a satisfied way. Talk all you want, he remarked, but I think I've got that business down fine now, and tonight, tonight, I'm just bound to prove to Bumpus here that the cream is on him. I knew I'd get it sometime. Well, don't crow till you're out of the woods, remarked Bumpus from the bow end of the canoe. I'm willing to be convinced, and it'll be worth all it costs me just to see you work that puzzle out. But you just know I can do it, don't you, persisted Giraffe. Won't say, answered the fat boy obstinately. Well, you might as well be counting up your spare cash, because I'm bound to show you at the first chance. It just can't slip away from me much longer, and I reckon I've got it clenched this time. And after that, Giraffe would not talk, but seemed to be muttering to himself from time to time, as though he might be repeating a certain formula that he believed to be the winning combination. They were not trying to make fast time now, because there was really no necessity for doing so. Having arrived on the chain of lakes that, with the St. John's River, almost makes a great island of the northern portion of Maine, they were bent on enjoying themselves. That meant going into camp at some point where the guides were agreed they might have the best hunting, and from that time on taking toll of the woods folks as their larder required, wasting nothing and refraining from hunting when food was not needed. They were true scouts, and believed in following the uplifting principles that govern the actions of the better class of sportsmen. As Step Hen so often declared, they did not want to be called game hogs, a term often used to describe the man who flings his catch of bass or trout up on the shore to die, no matter if he is taking ten times what he can use, or who shoots his deer in or out of season, and allows it to lie there wasted on the ground, food for the foxes or wolves. This country seems to be rather sparsely settled up here, remarked Tad, after they had been moving along the shore of Lake Winthrop for some time, looking up a desirable campsite. In the summer, you can see a tent now and then, it being some party as wants to enjoy the fishing, which is prime, Eli replied. But they ain't many folks as care about sticking out their winters here. You'll admit you must be some cold this far up nigh the Canadian border. But there must be plenty of game hereabouts, I should guess, Tad went on, because in the first place it has a gamey look to me, and then again you wouldn't have agreed to come along with Jim here unless you'd heard good accounts of the region around the Eagle Lakes. Just what I has, though I ain't never been all over em myself, returned Eli. But Jim Yar, he was born and fetched up in this country. 
so what he don't know about it ain't worth knowing, I guess, sir. It was about the middle of the afternoon that Jim declared they had reached the point where their tents should be pitched. Tad noticed that the guide made not the least attempt at trying to hide the camp. Indeed, the tents could surely be seen in any direction out on the lake. This gave him to understand that Jim was not taking water. He had come here to this danger ground with the main idea of meeting his irate father-in-law face to face, be the consequences what they might, because his wife had begged him to, and there was as yet no sign of Jim turning out to be what Giraffe called a quitter. Everybody soon found plenty to do. The rest had enough pity for Giraffe not to enter any complaint because he seemed to shirk his share of the ordinary labor attending the starting of the camp. They knew he had his hands full in solving what promised to be one of the greatest puzzles he had ever tackled. And so he was allowed to go off himself and work his little saw monotonously right along. Now it was the cord that failed to hold. Again, something else went back on poor Giraffe. But he kept patiently at it, grimly determined, and even the most interested of the lot, Bumpus, with whom the fire builder had laid his little wager, could not but feel a touch of admiration and sympathy when he saw how the tall scout kept at his task as the afternoon slipped away. When supper was announced, Giraffe came in smiling. Got it? demanded Bumpus eagerly. Well, just as good as done, was the cautious reply. I've mastered a heap of little irritating troubles, and just now the coast seems to be clear. Next time now, and you'll see something doing. One more river to cross, cooed Step Hen. It's always next time with Giraffe, you notice, fellows. But Giraffe was either too tired to argue, or else so confident of a speedy success that he felt he could afford to bide his time. Revenge would be very sweet after all the shaft the fellows had poured upon his head. He would wait. The supper tasted unusually fine that night, they all declared. Several of the scouts assisted in its preparation, wishing to show the guides just what knowledge of camp cookery they had picked up in their numerous outings. Even Bumpus superintended the heating of the canoeist's delight, which turned out to be a hodgepodge, consisting of some leftover corned beef taken from a tin, some corn, and beans with several cold potatoes sliced in the same. And the hungry boys declared the only fault they could find with it was that it disappeared too soon. But they had an abundance for all hands, even Giraffe admitting that he was satisfied when the meal was over. Then came the several delightful hours of lying around as close to the cheery blaze as they dared and having a good old-fashioned powwow, as Step Hen called it. Jim was quiet, but then he had never been a noisy fellow, and knowing what was on his mind right then, Tad felt that he had plenty of excuse for deep thought. During a lull in the conversation later on, Bumpus sat upright and exclaimed, There, did any of you hear it again? Sure as you live, it was the same long-drawn howl we caught on our other trip up the Penobscot region, and Sabattis, as well as all the rest, told us it was a wolf come down across the border from Canada. How about it, Eli? Was that one just then giving tongue? The old guide had not moved an inch. Indeed, he seemed to be very little concerned over the strange sound, but he nodded his shaggy head and made reply. Yep, that were a Canada wolf, all right. And as they hunt in packs, there must be more on them round these diggings, I expect. End of chapter 7 Chapter 8 of The Boy Scouts in the Maine Woods This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Debbie R. Baker Robinson the Boy Scouts in the Maine Woods by Herbert Carter The Uplift of a Boy Scout They all listened and heard the faraway howl several more times. Eli even declared that it was not the same beast that gave tongue, but a different one, and this seemed to bear out his statement that the animals usually hunted in packs. If a bunch of them had crossed the St. John's River and taken to chasing deer in the forbidden territory of Maine, the tidings would soon spread, and every guide be on the lookout. If so be you run across airy wolves, knock em over like vermin, Eli remarked during the discussion of the subject that followed. I guess everybody's got his hand raised against the poor old wolf, ain't they? asked Bumpus, who often felt sorry for the underdog in a fight, no matter if it happened to be a strange cur he had never set eyes on before. Why not? asked Tad immediately. 
when the wolf is no respecter of persons and will pull down anything that can be used for food the world over they are hunted because they do so much harm it has always been so from the time the shepherds of bible times tended their flocks on the hills of galilee and as long as living things stay on this old globe man and wolf will never agree and in every state where they used to run there has always been declared a fat bounty on wolves allan observed why right now maine is paying large sums of money to get rid of her vermin such as wolves wild cats panthers and snakes i've read that as much as four hundred thousand dollars has been paid out in bounties since nineteen three yes laughed tad and that's where the joke comes in i read that same article which was mighty interesting too it went on to state that some smarties are not content with getting the regular bounty they grow a gray cat that looks on the order of the wild article shorten the tail draw out the claws and then send in the skin claiming the six dollars that is paid for each bobcat actually slain within the borders of the state it was the turn of old eli to laugh now i heard tell o'er a sharper as cut off the rattles from a lot of old tame snakes he kept shut up and sent em in for the bounties each rattle brings and then he expects his pets to grow new rattles which howsomever i don't guess they can but that air story goes to show what some men will try and do to beat the poor old government people phew and i just can't stand for snakes at all remarked step hen if ever i felt one touch me i believe i'd nearly take a fit ha let davy do that cried giraffe quickly at which there was a shout that must have made the two guides stare until the joke was explained to them it seemed that once upon a time davy had been subject to sudden severe cramps in his stomach that used to double him up like a hinge and render him incapable of action his teachers at school had been duly warned and many an afternoon had davy been granted leave to go home because of a sudden attack though it must have departed as suddenly as it came since he was generally seen flying his kite on that same afternoon and the cramps never attacked him on a dull rainy day when he joined the scouts davy wishing to shirk hard work had commenced to have these queer cramps but wise tad believing that the other must long ago have outgrown the disorder and was only shamming laid down a course of treatment so severe that singular to relate davy had ever since been utterly free from the infliction which the rest of the boys considered simply wonderful and that was why there was a shout with all eyes turned toward davy jones when by mere accident step hen mentioned the word fit but davy only colored up a bit and grinned amiably that's a dead issue feller so you needn't stare at me that way he remarked composedly never again tad cured me right off the reel nothing like heroic treatment when all else fails he said and it did the job clean as a whistle i never can have a fit again if i tried you had better not remarked bumpus solemnly winking his left eye at step hen and significantly touching a good-sized club he had at his side but that howling of the wolves hunting for their supper far away did not keep the boys from enjoying a good night's sleep of course there was some sort of watch kept but those who were not entrusted with the vigil had no reason to bother their heads over it all night long they slept in absolute safety if eli jim allen and the scoutmaster took turns being on deck to make sure the camp was not raided that fact did not keep the other four from slumbering as peacefully as though tucked in their beds at home and under the parental roof another dawn found them awake and only too anxious to get a good warm fire started for the frost was surely around them and at that early hour it bit severely too but they could always depend on giraffe to coax the wood to do its best in dispelling the cold atmosphere and soon they were no longer shivering but fully dressed and assisted in getting breakfast tad cast his eye upward several times during the progress of the meal you seem to be anxious about something mr scoutmaster remarked step hen who had been highly favored that morning being chosen to accompany the leader on a hunt for fresh meat and step hen was therefore more interested than the others in what seemed to have aroused the attention of tad i was wondering whether we mightn't get our first snowstorm before another sundown that's all replied the other with a smile now however could you tell that when everything looks bright and oh be joyful to me up yonder burst out the wondering bumpus well there are some things one can know partly by instinct and find it pretty hard to explain tad went on to say 
I seem to feel a something in the air that says snow as plain as words. It may be just a sort of dampness, but that's the way about it. Then I notice the direction of the wind, which is northwest, and the cut of those few cirrus clouds lying low near the horizon. I can't exactly explain so that you could understand, but if I was asked my opinion, I'd say we'll see the snowflakes flying before many hours. How about that? demanded Step Hen, turning on Eli and Jim. He's right, cause there's a gonna be a summit o' a fall. Perhaps twon't amount to much, nobody can tell that, but it says snow all right, the first guide observed after taking a look all around. Me too, was all Jim said but he accompanied the words with a vigorous nod in the affirmative that stood for a lot. That settles it, Step Hen declared. I'm going out prepared for business. Never did like to be snowed under any way you take it. Too bad we ain't got a snow shovel along, remarked Giraffe sarcastically. Oh, you can joke all you want to, snapped back the other. You're so lofty you needn't mind an ordinary snowfall. If it got up to your chin, you could still manage to stretch that rubber neck of yours around and feel comfortable. But I ain't in the same class, you see, with my ordinary figure and short neck. But all I meant to say was that I'd keep my sweater on under my coat and stick my woolen gloves in my pockets. Loan you my earmuffs if you say the word, Step Hen, spoke up Bumpus. Well now, that's decent of you, Bumpus, the other scout remarked. But you see, this old corduroy cap of mine has ear flaps that can be turned down. It's just a bully thing for a cold, windy day. But after such a generous offer, Bumpus, why, I give you my full permission to turn over your badge. You've begun the day bright and early by trying to do a generous deed for a comrade. Of course, what Step Hen referred to was the well-known rule by which the great body of members composing the Boy Scouts Organization of America has been governed in order to teach the units of each patrol and troop the benefits to be derived from making themselves useful to others. In the morning, every scout is supposed to pin his badge upside down on the lapel of his coat, and is not allowed to change its position until he has found an opportunity for helping someone, either by act or advice, that is really useful. It may only be a very simple thing, but it teaches the lad, first of all, the useful attribute of observation, and after that, the still more precious one of service. Even though he but assists an old man across a street where vehicles are numerous, or take a market basket from the hands of a housewife who is staggering homeward under the heavy burden, the effect is the same. It makes his boyish heart thrill with a satisfaction that develops the trait of generosity, and gives every lad a more manly sensation, for he realizes that small though he may seem, he is of some value to the world. Oh, said Bumpus, blushing, I guess I hadn't ought to take advantage of such a little thing as that so as to get my badge turned. I'll find a chance to do something that's more worthwhile before the morning's an hour old. And Step Hen, if you bring home the bacon in the shape of a noble six-pronged buck, you must let me take your picture with your foot on the prize. Why, it will be the most valuable heirloom in your family years from now. Your great-grandchildren will point to it in pride and tell how you slew the jabberwock in the woods of Maine. Well, grinned Step Hen, wait till I get the buck. I don't count my chickens before they're hatched, and I hope for one thing, that when we do come back, there's going to be a little peace in the camp, and that our friend Giraffe here will have solved the riddle that's been worrying him so long. Them's my sentiments. Giraffe made a mock bow, as he remarked in his most amiable way, much obliged for making that wish, Step Hen, and from present indications, I've got a sort of hunch that something is going to happen along them lines woke up in the night after having a dream and it all came to me like a flash where i'd been making a mistake and as soon as i get through eating i'm gonna work trying to start things just like i saw in my dream oh i'll get there sooner or later by hook or by crook you never saw me give a thing up yet hey what's that remarked davy jones quickly how about that time you got in old farmer collins's watermelon patch one night and hooked a nice big melon he had doctored so as to teach the boys a lesson. Oh, I know, because I was along with the crowd, and seems to me you gave up everything you owned during that never-to-be-forgotten hour. I know I did, and I've never eaten a melon since without shivering. Say, quit that melancholy subject, won't you? demanded Bumpus. I don't like to be reminded of my wicked past, because I've turned over a new leaf since I joined the scouts. 
why you couldn't tempt me now with the biggest grandfather watermelon ever grown Brrr. it makes me shake just to remember some things that happened in those old days when i went with giraffe and davy jones and the rest of that lark loving crowd half an hour afterwards tad and step hen started out guns in hand knowing that the patrol leader was perfectly at home in the woods no one bothered about giving them advice or predicting all manner of direful calamities ahead let it snow and blow as it pleased tad was enough of a woodsman to know how to make himself comfortable and get back to the camp on the lake shore in due season of course bumpus had been more or less disappointed because he did not have an early chance to prove the merits of his new gun since he had been taking private lessons from one of the guides in the way of handling firearms but tad had promised that the fat boy and giraffe should have the next chance for a hunt they were canoe mates and seemed often thrown together perhaps because they represented the fat and the lean of it and as bumpus was fond of saying extremes meet Half an hour later, and the two young Nimrods had managed to get a couple of miles from the camp. But as yet, they had not sighted that wonderful six-pronged buck which Step Hen was to lay low. They walked along about fifty feet apart, Tad generously allowing his companion to be a little in advance of him. This he did really because he wished Step Hen to have the advantage of the first shot, being confident that if the other failed to bring down the game, he would still have some show before the deer could vanish from sight. Then again, it was just as well to have Step Hen in front. He was inclined to be nervous, and some sudden whir of wings, as a partridge flew out of a nearby thicket, might cause his finger to press on the trigger of his gun a little harder than he intended. Tad believed in being on the safe side every time. Step Hen carried a lovely little repeating rifle of the thirty thirty type and his ammunition was of the soft-nosed kind which as it mushrooms on striking is just as serviceable as a ball three times as large while tad had his double-barrel marlin shotgun a twelve-bore with buckshot shells meant for big game as they were passing through what seemed to be a tangle such as is seldom met with in the pine woods of maine where they had to dodge trailing vines step hen in trying to avoid one that threatened to catch him by the neck managed to stumble over a log and go sprawling forward his gun flying from his grip but fortunately not going off but immediately step hen commenced to thresh around as he shouted out as they were passing through what seemed to be a tangle such as seldom met with in the pine woods of maine where they had to dodge trailing vines step hen in trying to avoid one that threatened to catch him by the neck managed to stumble over a log and go sprawling forward his gun flying from his grip but fortunately not going off but immediately step hen commenced to thresh around as he shouted out tad oh tad hurry up and help me out of this my legs are twisted in the vine and something bit me i know it must have been a rattlesnake and i'm a goner end of chapter eight Chapter 9 of the Boy Scouts in the Maine Woods. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Debbie R. Baker Robinson. The Boy Scouts in the Maine Woods by Herbert Carter. Step Hen's Great Luck. Snakes! well step hen you're a way off if you think they're ever found out with the weather as biting as it is right now laughed tad who sized up the situation instantly and knew full well there was nothing of the sort the matter with his hunting companion well anyway something gave me a bite and you can see the blood on my hand right now tad whined step hen crawling once more into view and looking as though he could not be convinced to the contrary of his statement just because of a little frost he held up his left hand as he spoke. Tad took hold of it, and with those keen eyes of his, managed to grapple with the facts immediately. You only managed to strike up against a sliver of wood and got a splinter in your hand, he declared. See here, I can show you. Saying which, he used the nails of his finger and thumb for a forceps and drew out a little splinter that had pushed under the skin, just far enough to bring a drop or two of blood and give Step Hen a sharp pain. Oh, thank you, Tad exclaimed the other as though vastly relieved you see i just detest all kinds of crawlers the worst kind and that talk about rattlers and the bounty paid for their tails must have been hanging on my mind 
when i felt that sudden sharp jab of course the first thing that flashed into my brain was that i had tumbled on the nest of a rattlesnake and he took me for one of the bounty jumpers but only a sliver of wood huh i can stand that easy enough suck it good and plenty advised the far-seeing tad i always do as soon as i get a cut of any kind and especially if it's a splinter sometimes it keeps you from getting poison in your system that makes a bad sore step hen obediently did as he was told at least he had implicit confidence in the patrol leader and was ready to follow his advice under the slightest provocation that was a feather in the cap of tad brewster in that he possessed the full confidence of his comrades they believed in him and were never in a state of mutiny concerning the orders he gave as leader of the silver fox patrol once more the two boys tramped on tad thought it might be as well to impart a little useful information concerning the dormant condition of all snakes during winter time and how many a bunch of the wrigglers he had found while the cold season was on looking as though they were frozen stiff this information he imparted in almost a whisper as they moved along when out looking for a deer a muffler on speech is of paramount importance and knowing all about this tad soon relapsed into silence tell you more some other time step hen he remarked as a wind-up that is if you care to hear more about snakes no matter how you dislike the breed you really ought to know more than you seem to about their habits it might be the means of saving you from trouble some fine day when by accident you happen to run across some reptile in the woods and now we'll forget all that i'm not going to say another word unless i have to they kept pushing on and step hen began to believe they must be many miles from their starting point at any rate he began to feel a little heavy-footed though too proud to mention the fact to tad besides step hen had walked pretty good distances before and believed that he must soon get what he called his second wind after that he would be good for hours he fancied it must have been well on to eleven o'clock when tad felt his companion nudge him in the back as he turned to look step hen made a suggestive gesture with his head and pointed upwards there was a dead gray sky above them and already a few scattered flakes of snow really the first of the season were drifting downward looking like tiny feathers plucked from the downy breast of a snow goose tad simply nodded his head to indicate that he too had observed them and at the same time he shook his finger toward step hen afraid lest the other might be itching to start a conversation in fact this was just what the other scout was hoping to do this grim silence had begun to work upon his nerves just walking on and on with not a blessed sign of the fine buck they expected to get commenced to pall upon step hen in whom the instincts of a hunter had never been born although of late he had begun to develop a taste for roaming the woods with a gun over his shoulder but he had much to learn concerning the secrets that nature hides from most eyes but which are as the page of an open book to the favored few step hen began to twist his head around frequently at first tad thought he was developing a new eagerness to discover signs of game but then he soon saw that the wistful expression on the other's face was brought about by quite a different cause to tell the honest truth about it step hen was trying to figure out in his benighted brain just what the cardinal points of the compass might be it was not that he possessed any alarming interest in proving certain facts tad and allen had explained concerning the fascinating game of learning where the north lay by marks on the trees the general direction in which they slanted signs of moss on the north or northwest side of the tree and various other well-proven methods of locating oneself oh nothing of the kind step hen wanted to find out one particular fact they had started north when leaving camp and now if he could only learn that they were heading due south it would tell him that tad had swung around and was facing back home again and thus he would not be under the painful necessity of informing his companion that he was tired of the useless hunt when nothing worth while showed up and then it happened step in happened to have his eyes in the right quarter when suddenly a fine big buck sprang to his feet and stared at them a second or two before starting to spring away they had been heading up into the wind all the time which was a part of tad's principle as a true still hunter and the deer had not known of the presence until the greenhorn happened to step on a small branch which snapped under his weight possibly step hen never really knew just how he did it indeed he afterwards confessed to himself that his ready little rifle just seemed to swing upward to his shoulder by some instinct which was probably the exact truth for hunters seldom have time to do any thinking he saw that splendid deer standing there before him 
Now, Step Hen had often fired a target rifle at just such a picture of a deer as this in the shooting gallery in Cranford. And when he took a hasty aim just behind the shoulder of the startled buck, he was really following out his usual custom of covering the bullseye on the artificial deer, so familiar to his boyish eyes. Bang! went the rifle as he pressed the trigger. Tad had his double-barreled gun in readiness, and could have supplemented the shot of Step Hen by pouring in a broadside of small bullets that must have dropped the animal in his tracks. But he refrained, for his instinct seemed to tell him that the missile from Step Hen's little rifle had struck home, as the buck gave a convulsive leap and pitched over, and Tad knew how much a new beginner in the game delights in the knowledge that he has accomplished the work of bringing down a deer unassisted. True, the buck managed to scramble to its feet again and run, but even then the patrol leader held his fire, for he knew that the animal could not go more than a hundred or two feet before it must drop. I rung the bell then, Tad. Didn't you hear me? Almost shrieked Step Hen, so excited that he never once thought of pumping the exploded cartridge from the firing chamber of his repeating rifle and sending a fresh one in after it. And then, as the stricken buck scrambled to his feet again and went off at a wobbling gait, the astonished and dismayed Step Hen, who should have been prepared to send in another shot on his own account, actually forgot that he held a rifle calculated to repeat and wildly besought his chum to fire. Oh, there, he's going to get away after all, Tad, he cried, jumping up and down in his excitement. Why don't you blaze away and knock my buck over? Tad, oh, do let him have it good and hard. There now, he's gone, and we've lost him. It's a shame, that's what it is, when I so nearly got him. And he had six prongs, too. Oh, me! Oh, my! What tough luck! Don't worry, Step Hen, said Tad quickly. That deer can't get away. You shot him to pieces, and he's just bound to drop before five minutes. We'll just follow him up and find him lying as dead as... Just what Tad had in mind as a comparison Step Hen never knew. Perhaps he was going to say, as dead as a doornail, that being a favorite expression among the scouts. Or, it might be, Tad meant to take a little flight into ancient history and compare the condition of that buck inside of five minutes with the Julius Caesar of old Roman times. It did not matter. He was interrupted by a sudden loud explosion. The sound came from the quarter in which the buck had just gone and could not have been far distant, and even the tenderfoot understood what it meant. Oh, listen to that, would you, Tad? He burst forth with. There's somebody else hunting up in this neck of the woods, and they've got my fine buck. Now, ain't that the worst thing ever? And just when it began to look as if he ought to belong to me, too. For you said he was hard hit, and I just know I rung the bell with that bullet. And now I reckon it's all off. Oh, why didn't you knock him over when you had the chance, Tad? I sure would if I'd had the least suspicion that there was any other hunter around these diggings, declared Tad, with a frown on his usually smooth brow, for he instantly began to scent trouble. But come on, let's start along and see what it all means. Perhaps now old Eli or Jim may have wandered out to take a little side hunt. But anyway, it's my buck, Tad. You said I got him, grumbled Step Hen as he started after his leader. They had no trouble in following in the direction taken by the stricken deer. Even Step Hen, upon having his attention directed to the ground by Tad, could readily discern the trail of blood spots that told how the buck had been badly hurt by the shot back of the shoulder. And less than three minutes later, the two scouts came upon a scene that caused Tad to frown. While Step Hen's mouth opened with surprise, even as his eyes were unduly dilated in his intense excitement. End of chapter 9